Osher Lifelong Learning Institute run out of uh, UVM. I want to introduce, uh, I'm a member of the program committee. We're in, uh, the volunteers running uh, Ali right now are in very reduced form, so I encourage any of you who might be interested in keeping this program going to let us know. Grace Worcester, I hear, Michelle Champeau, and the mainstay of Ollie for who knows how many years, Bob Rosenfeld. <laughs> and we have one new member, Jim Callen, who could not be here this, the, this time, but you'll see her at other ones. So I, a formal welcome back to Ollie. Um, most of you probably got the brochure in the mail if you're on our mailing list, and if you're not on our mailing list and want to be, please make sure we have your name and email list. And I want to mention next week, um, a week from today, we will have the person who is doing <laughs> our filming today <laughs> is going to present um, a, her her own film uh, that uh, that's part of a series that she's been doing on on uh, Vermonters. Bill Picard, Man of the Land. Uh, that's in here. And there are a few extra of these brochures if you'd like them. So. Welcome back. We're thrilled to be here. And um, oh, and lastly, yes, most important, uh, those of you who have been coming to Ollie for years know that we have a, a wonderful volunteer who remains with us, Amalia De Stefano, who has been baking cookies forever. Nobody knows when that started. Fifteen. Well, she told us fifteen. How many? Fifteen. So, and she is wonderful, and she insists on doing it, and um, she wanted to welcome you back. So there are little, we, we can't really eat and drink here yet until we are rid of all our masks, but there are little packets of cookies for each of you. Please take one. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to let you know, since you're here, I might as well tell you, um, this is March somehow. <laughs> we don't know how that happened. But we're really excited to be basically putting on a whole month of not only Osher lectures every month, but, or every week, but we also have a really robust March for, Meal, March for Meals celebration happening this month to raise awareness and funds for our Feast Senior Meals program, Meals on Wheels. So if you're interested in learning more about that, we've got lots of information. We're gonna be doing a community champion week, the week of March 21st through the 25th. We'll have lots of exciting guest delivery drivers coming. And we also will be having a delicious Mediterranean meal for curbside pickup on Friday the 25th, as well as an online event. I'm hosting a number of folks who will be coming online with me to celebrate Meals on Wheels, including some local famous people and some larger from farther away famous people. So I'm very excited to be doing that for everyone. And really just thank you again for being here. We have also our spring classes will be registration starts next week. So if you're looking for other ways to engage and play, we've got lots of ways to do that. So thank you again for being here and I'll hit it up to Edie. Thank you. It feels so good to be back here. Welcome, everybody. Um, I want to, before I introduce our speaker, which I'm very excited to do, I want to mention a local thing, and that related to our speaker, that we have a local called Central Vermont Refugee Action Group, CB RAN, um, that, that is uh, very active right now, dealing with the settlement of a number of Afghan families. And I want to point out right here, Kathy um, O'Connor, and I've had a brain glitch, tell me earlier, who are, are members of that group, and I want to point them out to you if you have questions about what's happening locally afterwards. Okay, so Tracy Dolan, our speaker today, um, what, oh, People are waving, they're not waving at me. Okay. <laughs> um, was appointed uh, just in September, or uh, actually August, to be director of the State Refugee Office, which is part of the Agency of Human Services. Um, many of us were familiar with her name and her face because she served 
prior to that for 10 years as Deputy Commissioner of Health and coal, and most recently COLED, the pandemic response as part of the, the state leadership team. Prior to her work with the state of Vermont, um, Tracy worked with international, in, in the field of international public health, primarily focused on HIV AIDS prevention and mitigation and on maternal and child health in Africa. She also implemented child protection programs in post-conflict zones such as Uganda and Afghanistan. Uh, so without uh, any further ado, let me introduce Tracy, and we're very eager to hear about this. Uh, hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm very uh, happy to be here and I'm glad to be part of your uh, opening after two years of not getting together. So thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm just going to take off my mask if that's okay while I present, but I'll stay far back. And I'm all boosted, so I'm good. <laughs> um, so as, um, as she said, I am the director of the Vermont State Refugee Office. So I'm going to talk today a little bit about what refugee resettlement looks like, how it is structured in Vermont, the kinds of services that occur with refugee resettlement, um, the kinds of challenges that refugees face, and what's happening right now with Afghans. And we can talk a little bit about the Ukraine because I think people also are curious about that. And afterwards, or even during, if you have a question for clarification, you're welcome to ask I'm very flexible, however you want to do that. And I love this adorable picture. <laughs> uh, this is the essence of what we're trying to achieve in refugee resettlement, where everyone is together uh, and really living to their best potential, being able to be who they are, but also be part of a new community. Um, so I've got my little clicker here. And I wonder where it I point it that way. Maybe I point it here. I point it here. In that bigger agency, and we work out of Waterbury. The mission of my office is to promote and provide a safe and welcoming home for refugees and immigrants, and to promote their full participation as self sufficient individuals and families in the economic, social, and civic life of Vermont. When I say office, that's a very fancy way of saying me and one other person. <laughs> uh, so I am the director and I have a refugee health coordinator and I also have a business support person, but pretty much the two of us programmatically. So obviously we are not actually the ones on the ground doing the work of welcoming people on a day-to-day -day level. I'll try to describe how that works in a minute, but first let's just talk about what a refugee is. So a refugee is someone who's been forced to flee his or her country of nationality, who is unable or unwilling to return to that country because of persecution, based on the person's race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or political opinion, war, or violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution and has been forced to cross national boundaries and someone who cannot return home safely War and ethnic, tribal, and religious violence are leading causes of refugees fleeing their countries. A refugee may also be referred to as an asylum seeker until granted refugee status. In the US, a refugee, once admitted, may apply in one year for permanent resident status. And so then often they apply for, let's say, a green card. You've heard of green cards. And eventually, uh, or for um, permanent citizenship. I can talk to you a little bit about what's different about the Afghans in a minute, but I wanted to just share the key here is that refugees are not coming here because they'd like to come here or, um, hey, you know, maybe I'd like my life to get a little better. It's a, it's a dire circumstance and they don't leave by choice and so they're not, unlike sometimes people think, well, they're just coming here for, you know, because they can make a little more money or have a better economic situation but it is really quite a desperate situation. I'm just gonna play this poem. Um, this woman, uh, Warsan Shire, was the child of um, refugees, and she's a lovely poet, and I wanted you to hear 
what she has to say. Let's see if I can get to her. Home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one leaves home unless home chases you. Fire under feet, hot blood in your belly. And even then, you carry the anthem under your breath, only tearing up your passport in airport toilets, sobbing as each mouthful of paper made it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one would put their children in a boat unless the sea is safer than the land. No one burns their palms under trains, beneath carriages. No one spends days and nights in the gallbladder of a truck feeding on newspaper unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences, wants to be beaten, wants to be pitied. No one chooses refugee camps or strip searches where your body is left aching or prison because prison is safer than a city of fire and one prison guard in the night is safer than 14 men who look like your father. No one could take it, could stomach it. No one's skin would be tough enough to go home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry, niggas with their hands out, they smell strange, savage, messed up their own country and now they want to mess up ours? How do the words, dirty looks, roll off your back and maybe it's because the blow is softer than a limb torn off? Or the words are more tender than 14 men between your legs? Or the insults are easier to swallow than rubble, than bone, than your child's body in pieces? I want to go home, but hope is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of a gun, and no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home told you to quicken your legs. Leave your clothes behind, crawl through the desert, wade through the ocean, drown, save, be hungry, beg, forget pride. Your survival is more important. No one leaves home unless home is a sweaty voice in your ear. Run away from me now. I don't know what I've become, but I know that anywhere is safer than here. Oh, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, so Warsan Shire, uh, award winning, actually, she won awards for that poem. Beautiful poem, very harsh. Um, just really um, emphasizing just how little choice there is and how much trauma there is for people uh, leaving. And uh, I was going to talk to you a little bit. Ha, huh. I lost it again. Hey? Um, I'm going to try pressing that button that he told me not to press before. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I pressed it anyway. Um, <laughs> so... Normally, and I'll, I'll, talk th I'll talk you through this so that you can understand the difference between what's happening with our Afghans. Um, most people, once they are displaced from their homes, they remain in situations for five years or more. So for example, I used to work overseas a lot in public health, and I would go into, um, let's say, Kenya. And there would be refugee camps there, and there would be people in those camps from other countries who literally were living there for a decade, sometimes even 20 years. So people having their children in just a temporary camp in another country because that's who was able to take them in. And so their children go to school there, often living in kind of shacks, but it becomes your life while you wait to get finally resettled somewhere or go back to your home if it becomes safe enough. Um, and so often, five years or more, the average length of time a person is in a situation protracted like this, really spread out, uh, and will remain a refugee is 17 years. And less than 1% of refugees will ever be resettled permanently in a new country. So they're often just temporarily sitting out there and living their whole lives there in some cases. 
Um, low and middle income countries host most of the world's refugees. So you sometimes will hear pushback in a wealthier country that says, you know, why don't, for example, especially when there are challenges in, let's say, countries with a different culture or Muslim countries, there's a sense, well, why don't their Muslim neighbors help them? They do. They're doing most of the helping. So we do help, and it's a wonderful thing, but we help a very small share of the people who need this help in the world. Um, so for example, uh, like I said here, most people remain refugees for many, many years. So what's different about Afghanistan? The difference in Afghanistan was that the US government, because they felt a responsibility for the Afghans there, many of whom worked with the US military or other organizations, they felt that responsibility to lift people out. So those people were instantly kind of refugees, although that's not their exact status, and I'll describe that in a minute. Normally, though, if there's war or anything else happening in another country, People aren't airlifted out, put in a first world country, and said, okay, you're refugees now. Normally, they're shifting into other countries. And if they end up here, it's after years and years of applying for visas, showing all their documentation, writing out their story, um, petitioning to become a refugee. And then often, it's like a lottery, really, um, because most countries can't take everyone in. In the US, for example, they set an amount every year. I notice here, I noted here that President Biden um, raised the refugee admissions to 125,000. It went down to a low of 15,000 under President Trump. That's the lowest it's ever been since its inception. Um, so it went up to 125,000. But even that is only a portion of the people who would like to get somewhere. And so if somebody's in one of those camps, um, they will be waiting and, you know, it's just kind of lucky if they find out that they get to go. Um, and so that's how it works for the most part. So, for example, in the Ukraine right now, so, right, so we have Putin invading the Ukraine. About 600,000 people have left Ukraine as a result of that already, and they're pouring into neighboring countries. It's unlikely. <clears throat> that we would see any Ukraines if that situation stays that way. If it gets better, most will go home. If that situation stayed that way, it's unlikely we would see any Ukraines here, Ukrainians here probably for years, uh, because normally it takes years and years. So that isn't a situation where the US would say, oh, we, we did that, we need to airlift them here. Primarily, they will go to neighboring countries if they do seek to be here, they will apply to be refugees, or maybe they will apply for visas if they have relatives here. So unlikely that we're going to see any incoming Ukrainians, although that could change, but unlikely. The Afghan situation was different because of that sense of responsibility. <clears throat> I can talk a little bit more about um, what was happening in Afghanistan. So I was there um, in about 2001, so a long time ago, 20 years ago just after the Taliban fell, just after 9-11, so actually January of 2002. And uh, so the country was very excited about the prospect of freedom. Um, Afghans are very used to getting excited and disappointed and excited and disappointed uh, because um, unfortunately they rarely see any kind of long-term peace. There's always somebody coming in to take over and, uh, and often, um, the regular people like you and I, uh, and in Afghanistan, like just a regular Afghan, is probably not benefiting from whoever is coming in. And uh, so the Taliban was had fallen by the time I arrived in January. And uh, my organization, which was Child Fund International, many uh, non-governmental organizations like mine were there trying to do what we could to help. Uh, so my organization was setting up temporary schools uh, we were doing child protection work, and the goal of child protection work is to try to quickly develop normalizing activities for children so they're not so impacted by the chaos. So we were setting up schools so that kids would have a regular place to go every day and just be kids. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I found the country to be extraordinary. People were very um, self-reliant. Uh, we did not have a lot of resources to give. 
We would show up in the community. We would give anyone who could read and write, mostly the men, because the men would say none of the women could read and write, which wasn't true at all. But anyway, we would mostly train a handful of men, usually mullahs, usually kind of the Muslim leaders. And, uh, and then we would provide $50 a month and some kind of those beach tatami mats, you know, to lay down on the ground and some balls and some notebooks and uh, some, you know, some supplies. And that would be it. And then we would come back a little while later and see how it was going. And they would be running their schools like that uh, after just a few days of training. Um, they, they just took it upon themselves. So they would figure out how to secure things. You know, we, we never thought about things like security because we weren't giving them much. But when you have nothing and then you get a little something, you have to secure it. Um, but they were very, uh, they were very resourceful. And uh, I remember we, we opened up one small school and we drove back there maybe two months later to see how it was going. And we arrived on a day. So one of the things we helped them do was set up a schedule. And in some countries, the idea of a fixed schedule is unusual. So that was actually one of the bigger challenges, the idea of a fixed schedule. And the girls and the boys had to be separate. So girls had to go to school on different days than boys. So we said, okay, the girls will go Tuesday, Thursday. The boys will go Monday, Wednesday. So we arrived on a Tuesday. And we were arriving just at the time that we had suggested that they should start school. And so when we were coming in, we saw all these little girls running toward this small brick building with their little bags, with a, a, a pencil and a notebook. And they were running to go to school. And they didn't know we were coming. And, uh, and it was really the most boring schooling you could imagine, right? It was the teacher says something, the kids repeat it back, but they were wrapped with attention uh, because they had not had a school in their community before. And I remember at the end, um, we asked the teacher what the challenges were. And he said one of the biggest challenges was uh, getting the girls to leave at the end. <laughs> They were so happy, you know, to be there and to have something focused just for them. So they are just like me and you, um, very proud people. I remember we went to one area that had just been bombed so much during uh, the time of the Taliban and before that the, the Russians, and they didn't have much. So we would bring snacks with us to share while we did some training. And we were sitting around with mostly men again, and we had a translator, and the men were talking about something, and the translator told us, he said, they feel ashamed because you are a guest, and you have brought the food, and they have no food to offer you. And so these are deeply proud, very gracious hosts. They will give you what they have, and, uh, and they certainly did wonderful work, I'm sure, for our military there. Um, when you think of people working for the US, you might think they're all fluent in English. We thought a lot of them would be uh, when they started arriving. But actually, there are people who have jobs that don't require a lot of English, like mechanics or security guards. So as we have Afghans arriving here now in Vermont, we're finding that about 20%, maybe 25% speak English, but many don't. Um, most of the women don't, although some do. Most of the children don't speak much English. So uh, certainly, just like any other refugee arriving, we are seeing that uh, there's a strong need for English language learning. Um, and so the, the nature of the folks arriving, um, you know, as, they, as the US pulled out, you saw the pictures on the television of people going to the airport, um, desperate, right? Really risking their lives at that airport to get out. And that's because. Um, the Taliban certainly probably had their names on a list if they had anything to do with the U.S. military. And now we are hearing that um, they're not all getting killed, per se, but there's certainly a lot of fear. My translator at the time, his name um, was Abdul, his family and he went back last summer for a visit. He's a U.S. citizen and his wife and four daughters have green cards. He left to come home, and they were going to follow him a few weeks later. But then this happened, this crisis. So they couldn't get to the airport. So for months, they were stuck 
in the capital city, Kabul, and they were not leaving their apartment because they are associated with him and he was a translator for the US. So whether or not you know your name is on a list, there's a great fear. And certainly for women right now, um, some of them, the young girls are allowed to go to school. The teenage girls are not anymore. That changed after the US left and the Taliban took over. Um, some women are allowed to work. Um, most women are not allowed to work. When I arrived in 2001, 2002, the Taliban had just been defeated and I was meeting with two women who were doctors and they were so excited because they had not been able to work as doctors the whole time the Taliban was there and they were so excited to finally be seeing patients. So just a very severe situation, especially for women, especially for people who had been working with the US or any organization that would be working toward democracy toward Western concepts. So I mentioned that um, the difference between a refugee and our Afghan arrivals. So normally if you're a refugee, you arrive, we know you're coming months in advance usually, you have your papers uh, that say you're a refugee, you have all of your ID, we can quickly work with you, and you get services that the federal government provides. But the Afghans, they were moved out very quickly. And so they have a special status called humanitarian parole. We used the same status when we moved people out of Vietnam who were at risk, humanitarian parole. And in that case, they arrive either in the US at a military base, or maybe they arrive in a neighboring country. We still do all the security checks. We do the medical screening, but they don't have that refugee paper. Now, luckily, our government said, you know what, we're going to give them the same services that we would give refugees. So the things we would do for refugees, we're doing for the humanitarian parolees. But the downside is, you saw a minute ago that normally they can resettle permanently, right? You can see here that the refugees can normally resettle permanently within a year, not the humanitarian parolees. Right now, their only path to staying here is to apply for asylum. That takes years. Then once you get asylum, then you apply for a green card, then you apply to become a permanent resident, a US citizen. So if that remains the case, that they all have to apply to be asylees, that will be probably a 10-year process for them to become citizens. It's a huge amount of work. We don't have enough lawyers in any state in this country to take on all those cases. And the federal government does not have enough judges <laughs> to deal with all of those cases. So what people are asking is that Congress pass an act, an Afghan Adjustment Act, to change all of these people from um, humanitarian parolee to refugee or some kind of permanent status. Otherwise, they're going to be caught in this legal system and the government's going to have a ton of work and all of us states are going to have a ton of work for years and years. So that's where we are. We have, I can talk a little bit about, so this is our history. So here in Vermont, up until 2016, we were getting usually a, more than 350 every year. So from 2008 to 2016, we had more than 300 a year. And then we had a change in the federal government in 2017. We had a, um, the Trump administration came in and they said very clearly that they want to change the refugee program. They want to reduce it and slow it down. So you see our numbers starting to drop because remember how I said the president states a number, he makes a determination. So Biden said 125,000. So the president states a number. So when Trump came in, he started dropping that number very quickly. And uh, that number went down to 15,000 for the whole country. Um, and so that's what happened in Vermont, you can see. So you can see we have people coming from different countries. So this is until last year. You don't see, you don't see um, fiscal year 22 here, but plenty from Bhutan, from uh, the Congo. And these are all places you've probably heard about that have terrible civil war and strife. Um, we had many from Somalia as well. We had some from Syria. And, uh, and now in FY22, I'll tell you what our numbers are. Let me see if I can 
get to our numbers. So um, we have some regular refugees coming from other countries, just a few, because with this Afghan crisis, they put a hold on a lot of those, plus COVID, and they said, okay, we're gonna work on bringing the Afghans in. So currently we have about 220 Afghans. I'm calling them refugees here, but their actual status is that humanitarian parole. So USCRI is the refugee resettlement program in Colchester. And they accepted 130 refugees. ECDC is a brand new organization up in Brattleboro. ECDC stands for the Ethiopian Community Development Council. But it's not about just taking Ethiopians, that's just the name. So ECDC, brand new office opened up, took in 90 Afghan refugees. And in addition, we've had some other refugees arriving from some other countries. Um, and so that's where we are. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about who's arriving. Um, we have a lot of big families. Refugee families tend to be big because they tend to be from countries where the families are much larger. But we also have a high number of single men whose families are still back in Afghanistan. And that's because it was a lot of those men who were working with our military. So you can see why we would have a higher proportion. So they started arriving in Chittenden, Colchester area in about November, and up in the Brattleboro area in about January. So usually, when a refugee arrives, we know they're coming and we have housing ready for them, an apartment or a house. That doesn't mean we buy a house for them, but we found a house for them. But because so many Afghans were arriving so quickly, and because it's very hard to find housing right now in Vermont, I don't know if you've been hearing about that, yeah? Hard to buy a house, hard to find an apartment that's affordable. We did two things. One of the things we did, and I say we, it's not me, it's everybody else in the community. I'm just speaking like it was me. <laughs> um, one thing we did was use host families, which we don't usually do for refugees. It's better for them to immediately go into their own place. But we used host families, so a family gets trained a little bit, and then they help these people. They let them live in their house for a while and help them provide, uh, help them with day-to-day -day activities. And the other thing we did up in Brattleboro, we took a college campus. It's called the School for International Training, and they actually partnered up there. And so every Afghan who arrived went up onto the college campus, and they got cultural orientation there, some English classes. They were able to stay there. Their food was cooked there. And uh, so that's, that's what happened when they first arrived. And now we're looking for some longer term housing. In the Chittenden area of these 130, about 90% of them, uh, we have found long term housing, which is pretty amazing. Uh, you know, even though it's very hard to find housing, we have landlords uh, and just regular Vermonters who really wanted to help and who said, you know what, my place is coming open, I'm gonna hold on to it because I'd like to help some of these refugees coming in. Um, and in Brattleboro, they started arriving later. So right now we have about 50% of them this week who will be in permanent long-term housing. So that's a really great success. In many other states in the US, they do not have enough housing. And so they're keeping them in motels or hotels um, or in very temporary situations. So I feel like we are lucky in Vermont, even though our housing is tight. Um, employment, the update there, um, probably about, I don't know what percentage, maybe between 20 and 25% of people are already finding jobs. And those are the people who are available to work. So if there's a mom with three small children, we don't count her as available to work right now. Um, but most of the people who are single or head of household, um, about 25% of them are finding work. When we found out that Afghans were coming, so many employers called and said, we really want to hire them. Partly because it feels like a good thing to do, partly because there are a lot of jobs that you cannot find people to work for. <laughs> Uh, yes, you can. I know that the people that I've known that came here as refugees in the last few years were not allowed to work for a long time, even though they wanted to. So 
Yeah, refugees get to work right away. They have um, employment authorization, and parolees have employment authorization. But if you're seeking asylum, you don't have any status, so you can't work until you get asylum. Yeah, oh, it's too bad, yeah. So I should mention that. For the Afghan parolees, they were given um, employment authorization, which means they can work as soon as they arrive. Yeah, so they're not like a usual asylum seeker, yeah. Um, I'm just going to hold on to this because it's tricky to... Uh, and so that's what's happening with employment. Now, um, we're learning through research that speaking English is one of the most important parts of getting a job that's good and moving up in your job. So we're really emphasizing the importance of not only taking English lessons when you come if you need them, but really continuing it. Because if you get into a job at entry level, um, and your English doesn't get much better, it's really hard to move up. But if your English gets better, you can quickly move to a supervisory position. Uh, so some of the jobs that people are going into are factory jobs. Um, some of them go into um, you know, janitorial work up at the hospitals, for example. Uh, but then we have people showing up who are very educated. We have somebody who, uh, here who's an accountant. He used to work for J.P. Morgan as a consultant in Afghanistan. So we're looking, you know, maybe in our tax department, is there a high-level job? We have other people who worked in hospitals or healthcare. So one of them got a job at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. So we're definitely trying to get people into the right level. If you're ready for this, we don't want to put you here just because there's a quick job available. We'd rather wait a little bit and try to get you into the most money you can make. Yes? Would it be possible, since many of them were brought here because they worked with the United States, that the military could help them have a resume saying that they're A, good workers, what they did, and help them to get a jump on the job? You know, some of them do that on their own. So the question was, can the, U, can the military get them a resume? The military probably doesn't have the capacity to work individual by individual, but some of them do have reference letters. Uh, our military uh, were so passionate about helping some of these guys get out, by the way. Uh, I was getting calls from National Guardsmen here who said, um, I'm going to cry about this, but who said, I had an interpreter five years ago. He's such a great person. What can I do to get him out? You know? and absolutely willing to write letters. So some of them probably do have letters of reference, things like that. Um, so it's less about that and more about now just, do they have the English ability and can we find them the right job? Uh, absolutely, but the military and I would say our guardsmen here have just been wonderful in trying to help. Uh, and then all the employers, I mean, normally when refugees come in, you do get some portion of the population who don't like it, right? It feels different, they look different, are they taking our resources away? But in this case, because so many of them were associated with helping our military, I think it made some people feel better who might have otherwise been feeling threatened about it. So we've had literally nothing but positive response, which has been wonderful. So positive response from employers, from landlords, um, within state government, our Secretary of Agriculture, Anson Tebbett, he called me and said, what can I do? And so I said, well, the meat, they eat halal meat, they're Muslim, so the meat we have in most of our stores won't work. And to get halal meat, there's only a few grocery stores, or you have to go to New York or Rhode Island or Pennsylvania, and he, he wrote me back, he said, I'm on it. And a few weeks later, he and I and the president of the Islamic Society in Chittenden, we all sat down. He explained to us how people try to get their meat now and what the challenges are. And so now the agriculture is going to ask for money from the federal government to try to increase the production of halal meat here. So maybe a few farms one day a week will have their meat slaughtered in the halal way so that, um, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, halal way, that's probably not how you say it, but so that it is permitted by Islam. It's not actually anything very different. It's just, it's just a prayer and a slightly different way of slaughtering. But that's, that's the culture. And if you can do it that way, then that meat would be available. It sounds like a small thing, but it's huge. Imagine arriving in a country 
and realizing that most of the places don't have the food that your religion would allow you to eat. It's big. So the more we can do, um, even on that front, I mean, everybody wants to help. It's, it's been wonderful. Um, and then schools. So once people get here, uh, they, if they have kids, you want them to get into school right away. Now, if they're in a host family and we don't know where they're going to be long term, then we wait a little bit because we don't want them to start a school in Barrie and then find out they're going to be actually living in Montpelier, for example. So we want them to be in the school that they're going to be in long term. And some of the schools have great programs. So if you arrive as a five-year-old, and you guys know this because little kids are amazing, they are speaking English in a year. They put those kids in, they do a little bit of, uh, you know, the, a little bit of English language learning, but by the end of the year, those kids are ready to go into first grade with everybody else. But you arrive in high school, 15, 16, that's harder. So they have some programs where the kids go half day all year um, in an English language learning environment, and then the other half day with their peers. So it's hard, but you know, young people are resilient and they, and they figure it out. Um, and then health and mental health. So when somebody arrives here, they need to get their first medical exam, and it's called a domestic health screening. And it checks for everything. It checks for all the infectious diseases, um, and it checks for mental health. So the people leaving Afghanistan in some ways, it's even harder than if you were a refugee for years before you got here, because it's such a rapid transition. These people went from living like you and I, they've got their house, their kids go to school. It might not have been great, but you know, they had their life. And then suddenly, within a month, nobody expected that the Taliban would take over that quickly. And so suddenly they're pulled out and they leave. And so there are people arriving here who came from a village and have never been in a different environment. There are people arriving here who had a very good life in a city and now they're out in, let's say, Bennington, uh, you know, and it's just very different. So it's a really big adjustment. And it's hard because if you arrive here as a refugee, unless you're coming in high skilled, you're going to be poor for a while. That's just how it is. You probably have a big family. You're going to make it, you're going to get a job for $16 an hour. Probably your oldest child will also get a job for $16 an hour. Rent is outrageous, and you're not going to have a lot of extra money. So it's a tough adjustment. Not everyone stays like that. People move out of it. But to be very realistic, it is a tough lifestyle for a while. And I'm going to talk to you about what we do to help with that. Um, yes? Could, could you just define the difference between asylum seekers and refugees, please? Yeah. Refugees arrive here with status that allows them to apply to become a per permanent resident. An asylum seeker is someone who came here without the blessing of the US government or without the blessing of any agency. They have basically figured out a way to get in and then they've presented themselves. And, and I don't know all the details of the legality of it, but they have, um, they don't have any benefits. So if they arrive as an asylum seeker, we do give them some benefits in the state of Vermont, but they are not eligible for any of the refugee services because they have not been blessed by the refugee resettlement program nationally. I probably can't give you a lot more than that. I'd, I'd need some resources. Yes? Do they have health care services like Medicaid? Uh, do asylum seekers, can I think in Vermont, I don't think federally they're required to, but Vermont is very generous and I think asylum seekers get Medicaid if they apply, I think. Yes? Are there, do the masks represent a burden for the children to be educated in our country? Uh, wearing the masks for COVID? No, a lot of them were actually used to it in their own countries too. Yeah. Um, but, for, uh, but I will say, let me just talk through the benefits that um, the Afghans and regular refugees get so that you have a sense of what they normally get. So, core services. So when they arrive, and this is for refugees, including the Afghan humanitarian parolees, because they're getting the same services as other refugees. Um, and by the way, we don't have a lot of asylum seekers in Vermont. We do have a handful, but not a lot. Um, so 
core services for refugees, they get employment services. That means the refugee agency makes sure that they get some kind of training on employment because their culture might be very different. So arriving at a certain time, leaving at a certain time, calling in sick, um, and then learning the job, connecting them with the employer, helping them get a job, helping them fill out the application, so employment services. They get assistance with housing, so the resettlement agency will help them find housing and help them figure out the lease. Um, they get a one-time payment for basic needs. So every individual, not every family, every individual is allocated $1,225 and the resettlement agency keeps that and pays for things directly and gives some of it directly. But it's all meant to be spent on each individual. So for one single person coming in, that doesn't last very long. For a family of six, you've got eight or $9,000 that might last a little bit longer. So there is a myth out there that, you know, and people say this when they're frustrated because maybe they are struggling, but there's a myth that the U.S. government gives refugees all this money. They don't. They, they give them $1,225, <laughs> which is helpful. Then cash assistance. So basically, if you are a lower income Vermonter, you can apply for reach up. Have you ever heard of that? It's like, uh, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like a welfare type of program for lower income people, and it, and it gives them other services, helps them find work, etc. So most of the refugees who come in can apply for reach up, and they can get that if they are uh, a mom or a dad or they're pregnant. Um, but if you come in as a single, you don't, you don't qualify for reach up. Reach up is for families. So if you come in as a single person, um, the refugee program, my program, kicks in and gives you what you would get in reach up, but it's called refugee cash assistance. So basically, anyone who comes in gets, um, you know, depending on, it's about $550 a month for the first five to eight months to help them get on their feet, find a job. The goal of refugee resettlement, even though the goal of my office is to live a wonderful, long, prosperous life, the goal of refugee resettlement very specifically is economic self-sufficiency. So the idea is to come in, find work, and be self-sufficient. And it is the number one desire of every refugee. It's their first question, when can I work? They are desperate to work, right? I mean, there's a lot of dignity lost when you go through the refugee process and you lose a lot of control. And what you want to do is feel like, I can stand on my own two feet. You want dignity, you want some control, you want your own money, of course. Um, Medical assistance. Most refugees are available, eligible for Medicaid, pretty much all of them. Um, if they weren't, some assistance would be provided, but they're, but they're all eligible pretty much in Vermont. And they all get that screening, and then they get a primary care provider, a doctor, after that, a regular doctor. So those are the kinds of support services that occur. Any questions on the kind of services they get? And I'm sorry I don't have all the answers on asylum seekers so much. Yes? Yes, yep. So reach up, um, that application includes the food assistance. Yeah, so they can get food stamps or SNAP as it's called in Vermont, and they can get that again up to the first five to eight months as well. Um, and then longer if, uh, if they are eligible. Tracy? Yes. On the previous slide of the numbers, um, I thought it might be interesting to this group actually, it was the one where you were showing where people are. 30 of, as I understand it, 30 of the Afghans live in Montpelier. Yes, you're right. You know, I think I... You mentioned that you mentioned uh, You're right, yeah. Let me just go there, yeah. So I, I said 130 were assigned to USCRI, but you're right. 30 are in Montpelier. We've got some in Rutland. So I'll talk through that. Let me just go through that. So when refugees come in, they are assigned to a refugee resettlement agency. And usually people have to live within 50 miles of that agency. But because of the Afghan crisis, the government said, we're going to loosen that a little bit. So even though your agency is here, they could live farther away from you. So in the case of the Chittenden and, and, and this area, central area, some people are living in Chittenden. You're right, 30 are living in Montpelier. And then we have families also settling in, um, in uh, Rutland as well. And I think USCRI opened a small office in Rutland because they plan to continue that there. Yeah. And I don't know a lot about what's happening in Montpelier, but if you have any updates, that would be great. 
One yeah. thing about it that I know, um, I'm involved with uh, the Refugee Action Network here, yeah. um, is that they've settled um, families that speak the same language, and the idea, which is called Pashtu, and the idea is to have a, a critical mass of people so that there's a community. Yes, yeah, that critical mass is really important. If we don't have uh, groups that are big enough, they leave. So in the past in Vermont, when we have tried to settle families outside of the Chittenden area, they didn't stay. They left within months. And that happens everywhere. And that's because they don't feel like they have community. So in this case, uh, in Montpelier, we said not one family. Let's, let's do a few families. And let's have it with the same language so they're more likely to stay. Same within the Brattleboro area. A lot of calls came to my office from a lot of towns in Vermont saying, we're ready, we want to take families. And they said, why can't, why can't you send families to us? Well, first of all, we don't have a resettlement agency there, and it's a lot of work, and, and we can't just do that. It's not up to us. The federal state department decides where families go. But the second thing is, sending one family here and there, it's unlikely that will work. There's not enough services, and they will most likely leave which isn't good for that family, and it's not great for the community because, you know, they don't stay. So thank you for that. Yeah, that critical mass is a tricky one. Yes? Is the other feast days that would be Afghanistan as feast days that they could do, celebrate with one another no matter where they are? So yeah. On the internet or something? Yeah, like yeah, you know, for Eid, I'm sure they get together sometimes on Zoom. Um, but I don't know much about what they're doing yet, you know, so that's kind of new, but I'm guessing, uh, also, um, going to prayers on Friday is a pretty core activity, so that would be a place they might also connect. Thank you. Yeah. And we have amazing volunteers. In the Burlington area, we have one woman who cooks the first meal for everyone who arrives at the airport. So she, isn't that amazing? She just, even if it's a family of nine, she brings out this, all the food, she brings out all of the, you know, the to-go plates, and she gives it to whoever the host family is so that they have culturally appropriate food so when they go back home their first meal, they can trust that it's halal food. And she does that every time a family arrives and doesn't want any money for it, you know, because she was a refugee. You know, that's what we get. We get a lot of people. Another woman who was a refugee here from Bosnia, she came when she was six years old. And a few weeks ago, I went out to the airport and I met a family and we all went to this woman's house and she was holding the hand of another six-year-old little Afghan girl and she said, I was you, you know, I know. <laughs> and so she, she did very well here. So they have an extra house that they rent out. So she just immediately brought them to that home. They're gonna be renting that beautiful home. It was lovely. And I brought the family around, we did, you know, all around the house. And the kids, the two littlest ones couldn't speak English, but every time we opened a new door, they would look in the room and they would look and say, yes. <laughs> they were so happy. So yeah, it's amazing, uh, you know, when you've been through it, I can imagine you really want to help others. So that's wonderful. And, yes? I think they interact I think they interact with USCRI because the families are assigned to USCRI and then the local action groups then become the on the ground arm for day to day but maybe I'll pause and see if somebody has a better explanation there. No, that's absolutely right. I mean, um, our local organization which goes by CV RAM, or CVRAM, Central Vermont Refugee Action Network, um, works very closely with USCRI. Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat back. Yeah. So her local organization does work with USCRI. USCRI will let them know, sometimes with very short notice, a family is arriving. And this local organization will help them find a host family, help locate food, maybe even organize um, transportation for them to go to their appointments. So, so the local action groups that are helping 
are working with either USCRI or ECDC. Right. Yeah. Um, USCRI stands for the U.S. Commission of Refugee. I'm not positive what you, but it's the Refugee Resettlement Agency in Colchester. And ECDC is the Ethiopian uh, Community Development Council. That's the refugee agency in Brattleboro. We only have two, and two is plenty. <laughs> yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And um, so in the case of ECDC, they have a slightly different model for community support. They have something called community sponsorship. So a group of people come together, they raise some money, and they get trained, and they become basically like a community group that supports the family. It's called community sponsorship. So that four or five people or four or five families almost surround like a form a net around a family and they all take on different roles but it's the same idea that that kind of community family support volunteer yeah and then the donations you know you need so many things when you arrive um, of course furniture and clothing and ideally money so that people can choose their own things uh, you know so it is great of course that they can go in and pick out uh, what they need from a warehouse, but even better if a mother can bring her daughter to a store and her daughter can actually pick out her own coat. Again, the dignity, you know, that you need back after such a difficult time. Yes? If a male gets here and wants to bring, bring the rest of his family from Afghanistan. Yeah, that's a tough is one. Is that possible at all? It's pretty hard. So the question is, if somebody comes here single, or even if part of the family comes, and what about if the rest of their family stuck in Afghanistan? The reality is, if they're not out right now, it's likely going to be quite a while before they can get out. Because they did remove almost everyone who had a visa, and they removed all the US citizens and all the green card holders, and then they removed all these other people that we're calling humanitarian parolees. There are other people there who would probably qualify as a humanitarian parolee, but I don't think the U.S. government right now is prioritizing doing that. I think they're doing it little by little, but I know many of the Afghans who arrived are very hopeful that their families will come, and we are trying to temper those expectations because we are not sure, we are not hearing that there's going to be another mass evacuation. So that's very difficult. So many of them are wanting to send money home. Uh, and there's not a lot of money. So yes? No, this might not be a problem, but if you hear the term climate refugees, I assume they're not refugees, really, based on your discussion. But some days you'd be considering that there might be climate refugees? Yeah, you know, I don't have much, I don't have much background on it. I know what you know probably about climate refugees. Yeah, I don't know much more about it. But they're not, they're not refugees, is it? No, 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 no. They don't qualify uh, under the UN definition of a refugee. You think in the future that might be a possibility? Maybe. I mean, I, it would probably, if you are leaving because of a natural disaster, you're re you can be a refugee. So I don't know if it would be a new category or if simply climate drives some natural disasters. And if you have to leave because of a hurricane or because you were devastated by something, you would be a refugee anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, I heard that, that some of the that people that were evacuated uh, in August, um, some obviously were placed at the uh, U.S. military bases somewhere in the European um, uh, yes. U.S. bases. Are now the people that are in the European bases going to be coming to the U.S.? And if so, do we have any idea about when and yeah, so when people left Afghanistan in August, some of them went to European countries and some of them came directly to the U.S. bases. But some of them jumped twice. So they went to Europe and then they came to the bases. We have closed almost all of the U.S. bases, so they're empty. So I think we resettled about 75,000 Afghans here. But there are still more out in some European countries. Now there's a phase two. 
and we're bringing some of them in. And they will probably start arriving into communities in mid-April, but not a large number, probably in the lower thousands. Uh, so we might see 20 or 30 more here in Vermont as an example. Um, but there might be more out there, I don't know. I know some of them coming from Europe will arrive here at the end of March and probably here in Vermont, for example, maybe later in April. Could yes? we try to have them come through Canada? In the old days of refugee assistance, we used to take people to Canada and work it out with the authorities there. Yeah, well, Canada's getting their own. So every country is getting their own. So I don't know what the number was in Canada, but if there's a phase two, they, they will also get their own in Canada as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then the mental health piece. Um, uh, some people have had tremendous trauma. Some of them may have already been captured by the Taliban or tortured or imprisoned. Some of them may not have been. Um, the trauma of leaving so quickly and then they were stuck on those military bases with nothing to do for months and not knowing where they were going to go, not knowing if their family was okay. So mental health is a pretty big deal. And we provide mental health services. Many people in other cultures, when they come at first, they don't think about phrases like mental health. So if you said, do you have a mental health problem, they might think you're saying, oh, are you crazy? So they're going to say, no, no, I don't, I don't need that. So we have to think about different ways of asking, like, do you feel sad? Lots of people might say that. Or do you feel stressed out? And those are easier ways for us to find out and then to get them the help they need. Several years ago, I'll just go back here, we had uh, a lot of Bhutanese who showed up. And from what we could see, they were doing fine. And within a couple of years, there was a big movement of uh, suicide in the Bhutanese community all over the US around the same time. Um, so somehow, we did not understand what was happening. So we must have been using the wrong approach, or maybe there's nothing we could do, I don't know. But we had suicides here in Vermont and all over the country. Uh, the Bhutanese arrived, they seemed stable, they're very friendly, very smiley. <laughs> And, but there was a level of stress going on. And so at that point, we said we have to, the federal government put more money into mental health and said we have to do more mental health screening. But the challenge is we can't do it when they just arrive. We have to go back months later because that's when it gets stressful again, right? You're working, you've got kids, you've got an apartment that's costing you $2,000 a month, you know? It's stressful, so we need to go back and go back and go back and be checking on mental health and see what we can do. Counseling is one part of it, but probably even more part important is getting people together from their own community doing things they like to do. You know, I mean, a counselor can help you when you're down, but even better is when you get together with your friends and you go for a walk or you go camping or you go fishing or you do something that you like to do. And so sometimes our mental health work might involve getting the women together to cook, for example. Um, so I talked a little bit about the support services. They get some training in job development. They can get vocational training, job placement. We don't do a lot of job maintenance, and that's something we should do more of. Like, once people have a job, we haven't put a lot of time into figuring out upgrading, so we're going to try to do a little more of that. And then, um, and then social adjustment, English language, got to keep pushing the English. Um, in order to get benefits like reach up, like refugee cash assistance, you have to take at least 12 hours of English a month when you arrive um, for at least eight months. But honestly, more would be better because it's going to help you in the long run. And then interpretation. It's very tricky. The Afghans speak two languages, Dari and Pashto. Not all of them speak both. And when they arrive, we don't have a lot of Afghans living in Vermont, so we didn't have people who were ready to interpret. So when a new population arrives, we often hire some of them right away. So if they can speak pretty good English and, of course, their local language, we'll hire them as interpreters. But it's tough at first because we just don't have enough interpreters. And, and every, you know, you go to the bank, you need an interpreter. You go to the doctor, you need an interpreter. You go enroll in school, you need an interpreter. So, so it's tricky. 
Um, and then uh, the s support services includes daycare for kids and, uh, and citizenship classes for refugees. Um, hopefully these Afghans will have a change in their status so we can eventually move towards citizenship. With regard to the interpretation, every hospital or healthcare practice, if they get any federal money at all, like Medicaid, they are required to provide translation by law. But it's usually through the phone because of course they don't have people sitting in the back ready <laughs> to speak all these languages um, unless you're in a city where you have that population. So they'll call up a phone service and they'll get someone to translate, but that's really hard because maybe you can't quite understand, you don't see the body language. Maybe that person who is speaking Dari is speaking a slightly different kind of Dari, you know, so it's hard. Um, there's not an easy solution for that, but we keep working on it. But that's everyone, that's the complaint right now. Well, there's a bunch of complaints right now, but <laughs> that's one of them. They're like, why don't you give us interpreters? We don't have them, you know. And then the other problem with the Afghans arriving so quickly, they don't have identification. They didn't get the refugee papers because they're not refugees. They, a lot of them didn't have their passports because they just ran. Um, so they don't have, uh, some of them don't have enough ID. So they go to the bank to open up a bank account. And, uh, and the bank says, I, I can't open a bank account for you. Uh, now we, because we're in Vermont and we're small, up in Brattleboro, they met with a bank there and the bank said, okay, we'll figure it out. And here, um, and I don't know so much about the Montpelier area, but sometimes if you have a personal relationship, they will sit down and explain it. And I mean, it's not a lot of money they're on the hook for. They're not bringing in a lot, but. Um, so those are the numbers. So we talked about some of the challenges. Transportation, and in Vermont, that's a tough one, right? We do not have a great transportation system. We're not like a big city where you can jump on the, the subway or, you know. Uh, so it's already hard if you're lower income in Vermont, even if you're a Vermonter, even harder if you're a refugee. Some communities get together and try to buy, you know, maybe a, a cheap car to help people to start out but there's insurance and you have to learn how to drive and read the signs. And so they try to place people and house people in a place where they could at least walk or take the bus. But then getting to your job is tricky, you know, because those factory jobs are sometimes out of town. So sometimes the job might have a bus service, but it's not an easy solution. Isolation, uh, that's why we try to get people together. And then the cultural acclimation. Um, you know, the culture that the Afghans are coming from, for example, is very different. Um, you know, the, the relationship between men and women are very different. Um, the male is clearly the head of the household, and, um, and the woman is clearly meant to be home. But in our culture, that's not necessarily how it is. So to encourage the woman to come out to activities, the man might think, why is she doing that? And the woman might be less likely to speak up and say, I would like to go. So it's, it's tricky. And then we have very clear rules about you can't, you can't hit your kids, you can't hit your wife. But in some countries, it's absolutely acceptable to do that. And so we have to be very clear when people arrive here. The rules here are like this. And if you break them, they could take your children from you. And, and, and so it's a terrible thing to have to say right away. Here's, here, we might take your children from you. But we have to be that clear because we would hate to see that happen and it's avoidable. So some of the education early on is things like that. Other cultural differences, some people coming from other countries, their children are very polite compared to what we might think about children. Very respectful. They don't talk back, they don't raise their voice. And when you arrive here and you send your kids to school and you see children maybe yelling at the teacher, maybe swearing in front of a parent, and the parents from these other countries, they don't like that. <laughs> so they don't want their kids around that. So what do you do, right? You, you're looking at your child going to school and you say, I don't want my kid to come back and become like that. I, I like this part of my culture, you know? So, it's a lot, uh, you know, how do you, how, do re, how do you keep the things that feel very good 
and how do you change the things that um, don't work in this culture? Christine. Yes. Um, thus far, we're not aware of any cultural acclimation courses at all for the folks who live here. And we're concerned about it for the same reasons you were just describing. Yeah. That uh, safety, safety is probably the biggest concern that we've seen in terms of you, you don't realize it until you see it, how obsessed we as a society are with safety. And, uh, you know, kids riding on the handlebars, you know, a two-year-old riding on the handlebars, yeah. an eight-year-old, stuff like that. And, of course, then neighbors call and say, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, but we, from a preventive perspective, it seems like that's really important. And I know it's required of USCRI, but how do we make sure that, in fact, they have those opportunities because we don't as volunteers in this community we don't want to be the safety police or the cultural acclimation police yes one thing we are doing now for example i reached out to the police and to the department of children and families and they're going to put together some seminars or webinars on some of the other issues i mentioned so how you act between men and women what's acceptable what's acceptable within a house Things like physical safety, I don't know. That'll be, I'm a little bit new. I just started in September, so I don't know if that's already out there. But you're right, the cultural differences there are very different, you know. They're probably more like we all were, I, I grew up in like late 60s, early 70s. It's really more that style, you know, <laughs> where you just, just good luck, you know, just hang on to a handlebar and hope for the best. Uh, so, you know, so it's actually probably a little more familiar to some of us. But certainly the younger parents are probably uh, horrified when they see kids doing, or you know, um, you're not necessarily hanging onto your kid's hand the whole time if you're from another country. Your kid might wander out a little bit because you're not used to busy roads. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. I don't have an easy answer, but, but that is something to think about. What, how do you get those safety? Now, some of it just happens naturally, right? You look around, you do what other people are doing, and that, and that brings more safety. But yeah, and, uh, and we really want to get ahead of issues that could make the community turn against a population, you know? So anything we can do to get people acclimated appropriately, because all it takes is one incident for some people in a community to suddenly change their feelings about a group. So it's really important, uh, you know, to try to get that education out there soon. Yeah, do you have thoughts on how to teach safety? No. <laughs> no, I'm raising it as one example. I mean, I know that you know the workplace behavior in the workplace between men and women and all that. I, I mean, again, we're concerned from a preventive point of view. Yeah. I just was wondering how that's going, how and when that's going to be delivered. Because yeah. some of these folks have been here for three months. We've got a bunch of people starting work next week. It just it seems like it's none too early. To yeah, be. I think USCRI has a workplace course, and I don't know if these guys are taking it yet. We haven't seen it. Okay, all right, so that's good, thank you. Yeah, I'll check into that. Um, and then just the goal is uh, economic self-sufficiency, the stated goal of the Refugee Resettlement Program nationally. And so, um, you know, that's part of, you know, the, Governor Scott is very supportive of refugees uh, and these refugees, A, because it's the right thing to do, but B, we really need to grow our workforce in Vermont. We have a vacancy issue. And so uh, it's been very, very helpful. Uh, and and they, they really do enter all kinds of occupations. Here's a couple of our you know, more recent new Vermonters. Refugee men participate in the labor force at rates as high or higher than native born men. And refugee women eventually get there after 10 years. And more refugees become entrepreneurs than even um, American born. Uh, people. So this is a population that wants to work, they want to be entrepreneurs. And here's some examples of organizations that were started by um, immigrants, you know, Google, WhatsApp, PayPal, all started by, uh, by immigrants here in the U.S. So I'm going to pause there and see if there's any more questions. Okay, I think we're uh, all right. Thank you very much.